All right, so I'm going to put everyone on mute except for me um, to get started and just give a few directions. And then um, I will unmute you as it's your turn to read. Okay, so let me get oh, muted. That way we don't have extra noise in the background. All right. So welcome everybody to the Thomas St. Angelo um, Public Library of Cumberland's An Evening of Poetry and Pie. This is our third time uh, hosting this event. Unfortunately, we couldn't be in person this time, but um, I'm just so thrilled that this many people signed up uh, to read and to listen. And all of your names have been put on a piece of paper, all of you that don't work at the library. And I have them in a basket. And after we're done with our readings, I'll be drawing out five names. And so five people will win an entire pie. That was baked by Vicki at Peter Nanny's. And you will have tomorrow or Saturday to pick it up. I'm gonna email her tonight with the names of the winners so that she's all, all ready for you to stop and pick them up. So along with this evening uh, uh, event, uh, we have some other things going on at the library for April National uh, Poetry Month. In our display cases, when you come in the door, we have some examples of printed out poems and also explanations of what type of poetry they are. Are they a limerick? Are they a ballad? Are they uh, free verse? So it's a way to learn some different kinds of poetry. We also have a book display of uh, poetry. And then um, the materials and explanation of how to do blackout poetry. And one of the poems I'm gonna read is an example of that. And so I'll, I'll show you a visual of that as well. And then upstairs, we have a book display of books of poetry uh, within the E, everybody category, juvenile and young adult. And then um, we have a poem wrapped up and tied with a ribbon at the circ desk downstairs. And every time you check out, you can take a, a free poem. And it's part of the poem in your pocket program. And this is a program that every year um, posts 40 or 50 poems that you can copy and, and distribute without copyright, you know, infringement or anything like that. Some are Canadian authors and some are of our American authors. And this started in Virginia at a library where they were right downtown and they would have a, a staff member stand outside with a basket of poems and they would hand them out to everybody and, you know, put it in your pocket. It's a, it's a poem for you to take home. So we wanted to uh, recreate that here and each week there'll be a different poem so it's wrapped in a different color, color ribbon each week. So if you come every day to the library, you probably won't want to take one, but you know, once a week, you'll want a new, uh, a new poem. Um, you also could subscribe to a poem a day. If you go to Google and you put in poem a day, uh, you can set that up. So every day in your email, you get a new poem to read. That's kind of fun too. All right. So we have 10 readers tonight. And um, when it's your turn, I would like you to say your name the name of your poem, the author of the poem, and just a little bit about why did you choose to read that poem tonight? And, you know, a lot of the poems are pretty short, so take your time, we're not in a rush, um, and then the rest of us will be just sitting back, listening to your words and, and enjoying the poetry. So we're gonna begin with Thelma Johnson, and Thelma, I'm going to unmute you. And you have to unmute yourself too. And then take it away, Thelma. <clears throat> Mine is a poem of inspiration uh, written by Rudyard Kipling and he lived from 1865 to 1936. So many of these old, old poems are so inspiring. And uh, he would, uh, Rudyard Kipling uh, grew up in India of, of uh, English parents. And during the five years that he spent in the US, writing, publishing the Jungle Book and Captain Courageous, his popularity in America 
was second only to Mark Twain. And he, he received the, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize in 1907. And the poem is entitled simply, If, I-F, If. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies or be hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to set your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings and not lose the common touch. If neither foe nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And what's more, you'll be a man, my son. He wrote this to his son, of course. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Thelma, for participating tonight. Okay. Our next reader is going to be Deb Andres and her two grandsons. So let's ask you to unmute yourself. Okay, we're, ra we're rallying up the troops. <laughs> okay. And remember your name, the title of the poem and the author. Got it. And why you chose it. All right. So can you come over here? Can you introduce yourself? I'm Grayson Rupel. And I'm Cindy Rupel. Okay. I'm and, the Andrews Rupel. And we chose two poems from this book, A Pizza the Size of the Sun. And it's by, um, they're both by Jack Prelutsky. And we find that we really like to, um, when we're warming up to read, uh, we like to read poems and Jack Prelutsky writes a lot of silly poems. And um, as a teacher, I really like to use poetry in my classroom because it really helps develop fluency and gets kids excited about reading. So the first poem is A Pizza the Size of the Sun because who doesn't like pizza, okay? So Grayson and I are going to take turns uh, reading the stanzas of the poem. A pizza the size of the sun. Oh, and before we start, 
We really like it when you visualize, like you think about what, what do the words say and what would this taste like and smell like and what would it look like? Okay, a pizza the size of the sun. I'm making a pizza the size of the sun, a pizza that's sure to weigh more than a ton, a pizza too massive to pick up and toss. A pizza resplendent with oceans of sauce. Your turn. I'm topping my pizza with mountains of cheese, with anchors of peppers, pimentos, and peas, with mushrooms, tomatoes, and sausage galore, with every last olive they had at the store. My pizza is sure to be one of a kind. My pizza will leave other pizzas behind. My pizza will be a delectable treat that all who love pizza are welcome to eat. The oven is hot. I believe it will take a year and a half for my pizza to bake. I can hardly wait till my pizza is done. My wonderful pizza the size of the sun. All right. So that was pizza the size of the sun. And then, hurry, Grandma, hurry. what's the title of this poem? Finley. Hurry, Grandma, hurry. Finley, tell them. Hurry, Grandma, hurry. Hurry, Grandma, hurry. Okay. Hurry, Grandma, hurry. Grandma, look at me. I'm right side up. I'm upside down. I'm swinging from a tree. I'm jumping <coughs> like a squirrel. I think that I can fly. Grandma, please don't worry. Grandma, please don't cry. Hurry, Grandma, hurry. See what I can do? I'm roller skating backwards across the avenue. There's a luscious little bug. I think I'll take a bite. Grandma, stop your screaming. Everything's all right. Hurry, Grandma, hurry. Grandma, watch me, please. I'm climbing up a ladder. I'm dangling from my knees. I found this giant spider that was stuck in globs of paint. Grandma, take a closer look. Whatever made you faint. So we chose that poem because two little boys on my lap kind of do things like that to make their grandma uh, kind of excited about things. So thank you. <laughs> Very thank good. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And our next reader is Diana Ficacillo. So Diana, if you would unmute your microphone, please. Hello, I'm Diana Ficicello, and I'm going to be reading Hope by Emily Dickinson. And she was quite a uh, to herself person, famous for many of her poems, but really wasn't discovered until after she died. She died when she was 55 and really a recluse. Her uh, sister discovered the poems and they were stuffed in socks and closets. And, and this is a very short poem. Um, in my family, my sister and my mother, for whatever reasons, we always called each other birds. And so this really is about a bird, but the bird is um, how we see life. <clears throat> and so here it is, hope by Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird they kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chilliest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity, it asked a crumb of me. Thank you for letting me read a poem. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Next is Linda McConnell. I think I'm on now. 
I'm Linda McConnell. Actually, um, I'm here today because uh, my sister, Pat Chuchwar, is the one who uh, signed me up, I guess, for this. Um, and the, the poem I'm going to be reading is one that I've written. Uh, it is a free, free verse poem. It was written by me on a day when we had just a lot of sad events uh, taking place. And so it is a very sad poem, I have to say. Uh, but one I think that reflects perhaps the feelings um, we all have on a, on a bad day, you know, about life in general. So it is called Reflections. People I knew have passed. People I loved have passed. The world still holds promise yet it seems less attainable. Time passes quickly. Good sleep and less pain have become the measurements of a good day. Our world has been invaded by a new life form, technology. It spins wildly as it invades all aspects of our lives with promises of speed and efficiency. Yet we are standing still. We are children watching a merry-go-round. We want to ride but can't because we don't have a ticket. Our comfort zone has moved closer to our core. Friends visit less because we have less to talk about. Things we want are no longer accessible. We are dying day by day, inch by inch, increasingly alone, watching the merry-go-round, we can no longer ride. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Linda. Next is Dave Evenson. Dave, if you'll unmute yourself. I think I'm here now. Okay. Okay. I don't have a camera, so you can't see my stovepipe hat. I am uh, looking just like Abe Lincoln. I'm not quite as tall as he was, but I'm looking a lot like him right now. Hey, Dave, could you move closer to your microphone or speak louder? I can barely hear you. I will be both. My, my poem, Dave even said, my poem is by Abraham Lincoln, that famous poet. And it's about a bear hunt. And he was the rail splitter, as we know. This would probably be in the 1830s. And Illinois was on the, uh, on the frontier. Uh, it's, it's hard to think of him that way, but that's true. I, I have two words I want to tell you before I start this. A fice, F-I-C-E, is a, a cur or a mongrel or a mutt, usually a small dog. And it comes into play in this uh, in this poem of the bear hunt or bear chase. Secondly, the chase, G C H A C E. So there we go. It's a, a wild bear hunt. A wild bear chase didst never see, then hast thou lived in vain. The richest bent of glorious glee lies desert in thy brain. When first my father settled here, t'was then the frontier line. The panthers scream, filled night with fear, and bears played on the swine. But where the bears shut lip on when rose the squealing cry, now man and horse with bag and gun, for vengeance at him fly. A sound of danger strikes his ear. He gives the breeze a snuff. Away he bounds with little fear and seeks the tangled rough. On presses foes and reaches the ground where his, where his left has half munched meal. The dogs in circle send around and find his fresh made trail. With instant cry away they dash and men as fast pursue or logs they leap through water splash and shout the brisk hello. Now to elude the eager pack, bear shuns the open ground. 
Through matted vines he shapes his track and runs it round and round. The tall fleet cur, with deep voice, now speeds him at the wind. While half-grown pump and short-legged vice, this is the vice, the mongrel dog, are yelping far behind. And fresh recruits are dropping in to join the merry corps. With a yelping yell, a mingled din, the winds are in a roar. And round and round the chase now goes, the winds are live with fun. Nick Carter's horse, his rider throws, and there, Hill drops his gun. Now sorely pressed, Bear glances back and lies his tired tongue, when as, to force him from his track, an ambush on him sprung. Across the glade he sweeps for flight, and Bear is in view of the dogs new fired by the sight, their cry and speed renew. The foremost ones now reach his rear, he turns and dashes away, and circle now, the wrathful bear, they have him full at bay. At top of speed, the horsemen come, all screaming in a row. Tiger, seize him, drum, bang, bang, the rifles go. And furious now, the dogs he tears and crushes in his ire. He is right and left and upward rears with eyes of burning fire. But leaden death is at his heart, the vein all the strength he plies, and spouting blood, blood from every part, he reels and sinks and dies. And now a some clamor rose about who should have his skin. Who first draws blood, each hunter knows, this prize must always win. But who did this, and how to trace what's true from what's a lie? Like lawyers, in a murder case, they stoutly argue by. That's another good word, argue by. A press at dice, this is that little dog, a pestering mood behind and quite forgot. Just now emerging from the wood, arrives upon the spot. With grinning teeth and upturned hair, brim full of spunk and wrath, he growls and seizes on dead bear and shakes for life and death. And swells as if his skin would tear, and growls and shakes again, and swears as plain as dark can swear that he has won the skin. <laughs> Conceited whelp, we laugh at thee, nor mind that now a few of pompous two legged dogs there be, conceited quite as you. A bear chase by Abraham Lincoln. Dave, did you tell us why you chose that poem? I did not. I chose that poem because it's it's that well-known author, a well-known uh, statesman, and, and not something you would expect from him. I mean, it's uh, Abraham Lincoln, we know, is a great orator and writer, and and uh, obviously we had a sense of humor as well, and, and he does point out uh, the human frailties of claiming what's not our own, and uh, the literally arguing, and uh, it, was, it was just a fun story. Very good. Thank you so much. Well, next, I'm going to read three very short poems um, from a book called Thank Ku. I don't know. Can, I, can you see me on the screen? I suppose I've muted you all, so you can't tell me. Let's see. I want to make sure that you can see what I'm showing you. Hmm. A little technical problem here. Let's see. I'm going to un ask uh, Pat or uh, Linda to unmute yourself so that somebody can answer me. <laughs> yeah, you can raise it up just a little bit. There you go. So we OK. Can want us to see the whole book, right? Yeah, I couldn't see myself there, so I didn't know what was going on. Okay, got it. So the name of this book is called Thank You, uh, Poems of Gratitude. And the first one I want to show you is uh, Blackout Poetry. And it looks like this. And in Blackout Poetry, a poet takes a found document, 
usually uh, traditionally a print newspaper or, and then crosses out a majority of the existing text, leaving visible only the words that comprise his or her poem, thereby revealing an entirely new work of literature birthed from an existing one. And this particular poem is called Drops of Gratitude by Carol Lindstrom. And the words that were left on the page were rain, fell, water, dripped from the roof, drips thumped, dust, gritty drops, insects greet the rain. And so they called this format a found poem, but um, I think it's a good example of blackout poetry as well. The next one I'm going to read to you is called a grace, uh, see, Thankful for Thinking by Vanessa Brantley Newton. And this is a limerick, which I'm sure many of you are uh, accustomed to that format. There's no telling the places our brains can take us or ways in which our thoughts can shape us. Smart and happy or creative, brave, elated, innovative, there's no telling the people our dreams will make us. And the last one I want to read, I think a lot of us can identify with, I know I can, and my grandchildren can now, it's called The Perfect Rock. And this, is a, this format is a ballad. It's by Jamie McGillan. Beside the ocean, blue as me, I saw an egg-shaped rock. I don't know why it winked at me to interrupt my walk. All slippery and black as coal, it fit right in my hand. My lonely frown fell down a hole, forever lost in sand. It nestled in my little fist, the smoothest, kindest stone. I can't believe I almost missed this treasure of my own. I squeezed it tight and made a wish. I almost threw it back where foamy waves and scaly fish could swallow or attack. Instead, I held it to my cheek, my perfect ocean rock. I'm grateful that it winked at me and chose me on that walk. Um, this is in one of the books on, uh, in our display upstairs that I hope that you all will take a look at. All right, next up is Emily, my coworker. And um, be sure to tell us the name of your poem because I didn't have it at the time that I sent out the uh, list, the author and why you chose it. All right. My poem is called The Owl Critic by James T. Field. And I chose it because I like a good story poem, one that keeps you captivated and is a little bit funny, but yet has some wisdom in it. Okay. Who stuffed that white owl? No one spoke in the shop. The barber was busy and he couldn't stop. The customers waiting their turns were all reading. The Daily, the Herald, the Post little heeding, the young man who blurted out such a blunt question. Not one raised a head or even made a suggestion, and the barber kept on shaving. Don't you see, Mr. Brown, cried the youth with a frown, how wrong the whole thing is, how preposterous each wing is, how flattened the head, how jammed down the neck is. In short, the whole owl, what an ignorant wreck it is. I make no apology, I learned owlology. I've passed days and nights in a hundred collections and cannot be blinded to any deflections arising from unskilled fingers that fail to stuff a bird right from his beak to his tail. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, do take that bird down or soon you'll be the laughing stock all over town. And the barber kept on shaving. I studied owls and other night fowls and I tell you what I know to be true an owl cannot roost with his limbs so unloosed. No owl in this world ever had his claws curled, ever had his legs slanted, ever had his bill canted, ever had his neck screwed into that attitude. He can't do it because tis against all bird laws. Anatomy teaches, ornithology preaches. An owl has a toe that can't turn out so. I made the white owl my study for years and to see such a job almost moves me to tears. Mr. Brown, I'm amazed. You should be so gone crazed as to put up a bird in that posture, absurd. 
to look at that owl really brings on a dizziness. The man who stuffed him didn't know half his business. And the barber kept on shaving. Examine those eyes. I'm filled with surprise. Taxidermists should pass. Off on you such poor glass. So unnatural they seem. They'd make Audubon scream and John Burroughs laugh to encounter such chaff. Do take that bird down, have him stuffed again, Brown. And the barber kept on shaving. With some sawdust and bark, I could stuff in the dark. An owl better than that. I could make an old bat look more like an owl than that horrid fowl. Stuck up there so stiff like a side of coarse leather. In fact, about him, there's not one natural feather. Then just with a wink and a sly normal lurch, the owl very gravely got down from his perch, walked around and regarded his fault-finding critic, who thought he was stuffed with a glance analytic, and then fairly hooted as if he should say, your learning's at fault this time anyway. Don't waste it again on a live bird, I pray. I'm an owl, you're another. Sir Critic, good day. And the barber kept on shaving. Very nice, thank you. Okay, next up are the brooders, Pat and Tom. There we go. I'm gonna go first. Um, I chose, I'm Pat Bruder. I chose uh, a poem by Kitty O'Mara and the title is, And the People Stayed Home. And I looked up a little bit about her. She's from Madison. And she wrote this poem in March of 2020 in a response to how anxious she was about the pandemic and what quarantine was gonna to do to everybody. She had some relatives who worked in the health field. She was, she was concerned. And she um, wrote the poem and in one place I read, she wrote the poem and then she posted it. And in another place I read, she just sat down at her computer on her Facebook page and, and typed this up and posted it. Uh, and any, however it went, she wrote this poem and posted it and it went viral. And there, there were, it's been translated into 20 languages. There have been short films made, put into music, ballet. There's an opera singer who put this to music. Uh, Oprah promoted it. Uh, Kate Winslet did the reading of the, I don't know if it's an audio book or, or what, but I mean, just everybody got involved. And she finally, not finally, from the March until late fall, put together a, a hard, a book with, with just the poem in it. I mean, that's what it is. And she got an illustrator, you know, a couple lines on a page, but this is the book. And this one was the second publishing in November of 2020. So not that long ago. And um, the reason I'd like to read it, I, it's short and um, it has some kind of hope for those of us that have been, well, all of us have been living through uh, COVID. Um, so the title, uh, and the people stayed home. Okay. And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced. Some met their shadows. And the people began to think differently and the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses, made new choices, dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed by Kitty O'Mara. Okay, that's that one. And this is my husband, Tom, for our second one. Uh, we chose a poem about crickets. This is the two of us will be involved here. We have sound effects we made up. <laughs> Bear with us. Okay, we chose this because of our concern of not hearing crickets like we used to hear. And uh, I thought it was because we were getting older and our hearing was leaving us. But I looked it up and there's, a, there's a, a reason for this. Because of habitat changes, because of farming 
uh, changes and because of uh, global warming and because of viruses that have hit all over Europe and Australia, New Zealand. So we're losing crickets and it's, it's sad for us because we like crickets. So this is our um, tribute to crickets and we're gonna try to get through this with the two of us okay. doing it together here. Okay. So this is called House Crickets by Paul Fleischman. We don't live in meadows, cricket, 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 or in groves. We're house crickets living beneath this gas stove. Cricket, cricket, cricket. Others may worry, cricket, 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 about fall. We're scarcely aware of the seasons at all. Cricket, cricket, cricket. Spring to house crickets, cricket, 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 means no more than the time when fresh greens once again grace the floor. Cricket, cricket, cricket. Summer's the season, cricket, cricket, cricket. For pie crumbs. Peach, pear, boysenberry, apricot, and plum. Cricket, cricket, cricket. Pumpkin seeds tell us, cricket, cricket, cricket. Falls arrive. While hot chocolate spills hint that it's winter outside. No, no matter, matter the, the month, month, we'll stay well fed and warm. Unconcerned about cold fronts and wind chills and storms, but while, while others, others are ruled by the sun in the heavens, whose varying height brings the season's procession. We, we live, live in, in a world of fixed Fahrenheit. Cricket, cricket, cricket. Thanks to our sun, our unchanging, reliable, steadfast and stable, bright blue pilot light. <laughs> nice. That was fun. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And for our last reader, Brandy. Please uh, tell us your name and the name of your poem and the author that you have chosen and why. Um, so my name is Brandy Anderson. Uh, I chose a poem called Miss Me But Let Me Go. From what I could tell, uh, I could not find an author actually. It's an author unknown. I chose this. Um, I heard it this winter at a funeral for a young person who had taken their own life. And um, in 2019, our family had two people do that within a month of each other. And so um, when I heard this at that funeral as well, it made me think that that's what this is, is, is like a message from those people that have gone before us. And it's how they want us to be. They don't want us to grieve um, in and be sad for a long time. Um, and it kind of made me think that's what I, this is how I think a lot of people would like the ones that we leave behind to respond. So um, I just thought I'd share it because I thought a lot of people have lost people this year more than normal. So miss me, but let me go. When I come to the end of the road and the sun has set for me, I want no rights in a gloom filled room. Why cry for a soul set free? Miss me a little, but not for long, and not with your head bowed low. Remember the love that we once shared. Miss me, but let me go. For this is a journey we all must take, and each must go alone. It's all a part of the master's plan, a step on the road to home. When you are lonely and sick of heart, go to the friends we know, and bury your sorrows in doing good deeds. Miss me, but let me go. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. This has been really fun listening to a great, great variety of poems. And now I'm going to draw five names out for the winners of the pies. Okay. And the first winner is Linda McConnell. Wow. Well, my sister's going to pick up a pie for me then. Okay. Second winner is Dave Evenson. Who I, I thought I talked to about sharing, the concept of sharing, but I don't know. The next winner is Diana Piccicillo. Oh, this is somebody who didn't attend. So they're out. Randy Anderson. And the last Thank you. one. My son is very excited next to me. <laughs> <laughs> Good. 
Thelma Johnson. So I'll have to email her. She had to leave early to go to a meeting. So thank you all so much for participating. This has been a really fun event. And I hope next year we'll all be here at the library eating together and talking and uh, hearing and reading some more poems. So happy National Poetry Month and have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for putting it together. Okay.